Hi, uh, my name is Gary Barker, and I'm here uh, to talk about greenwashing, and um, especially how it works in the financial world. Um, there's been a lot of talk about greenwashing, and um, and oh, there you are, Alex. Good morning. Hi, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. We're just getting started here. And uh, let me just uh, start out by introducing the topic here. Uh, the topic is flushing out greenwashing. And uh, some firms and nation in their rush to reach green goals and ESG targets overclaim their credentials. Will investors react and divest in these firms? Uh, by when will excessive claims be found wanting or simply delayed, deserving further investment? Is there a new role for the banking investment regulators in this matter? And talking about this is uh, Alexandra Wright Gladstein. Uh, Alexandra, why don't you um, give us a, a little bit of background into your history? Sure. Um, I have been passionate about preventing climate change my whole career. Um, I started my first company called IR Labs in 2015. We spun a technology out of MIT that makes data centers and supercomputers more energy efficient by using light to move data between chips. And then it was, well, and, and so that company has now grown. We have customers like Intel and Hewlett Packard Enterprise who are helping get their chips communicate using light. Um, and it was not too long after setting up that company that we started offering a retirement savings plan for our um, employees. In the U.S., it's mm -hmm. called a 401k plan. And um, at the time, I asked our providers to include a climate-friendly investment option for our employees. I knew it was something our employees care about. It's part of the mission of the company. So it seemed like a no-brainer to have this option um, included in the 401k fund menu. And um, it ended up actually being really hard to accomplish. And I was just really surprised uh, how hard it was. It took over three years to get a single climate friendly option in the lineup. Um, and what year is this? This was, you know, I first was looking into setting up our 401k in 2016 and it, mm -hmm. it went live in uh, January, 2017. And uh, it wasn't until 2020 that we had some, some good green options. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for our employees. And, you know, in particular, I was being a little picky. I wanted to have uh, our climate friendly options not be invested in fossil fuel companies. And that was really mm -hmm. tough to accomplish. Um, so, yeah, I started digging into trying to figure out why it was so hard. And I learned that there are a lot of real structural reasons. It's hard to offer climate friendly investment options to employees in 401ks, but none of them are insurmountable. It just seemed like no one had tried to make it easy before. So I eventually decided to start my next company, which is called Sphere, which is making it easy for employers to offer climate-friendly options uh, in 401ks for employees. Great. And um, I'll, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Gary Barker. I'm Director of Sustainability for NextGen Packaging. Uh, previously, I was founder and CEO of Ditto SBS, which is a green product design company. Um, our, our flagship uh, product was uh, the Ditto Sustainable Hanger for retailers, and uh, our goal was to create a sustainable hanger to replace the 20 billion plastic hangers that end up in landfill every year. Uh, so we came up with a paper fiber board hanger, but we also do sustainable packaging. And um, obviously in the, in the product sector, there's a lot of green washing as well. Um, just going through what exactly green washing is, it was a, a term that was uh, first coined by Jay Westerveld in 1986. And he says green washing is when a company or organization spends more time and money on marketing themselves as environmentally friendly than on minimizing their environmental impact. It's a deceitful advertising gimmick gimmick intended to mislead consumers who prefer to buy goods and services from environmentally uh, conscious brands. And a 2018 showed that among the products in a big store, roughly 98% of the claims that were given as far as sustainability are concerned were greenwashing. And 78% uh, in a recent survey of consumers said that they could not identify greenwashing. And so just my first question to you is, um, greenwashing and, and green marketing, um, you know, in, in financial 
vehicles. Um, are they the same thing? Or are they, they different? How do you differentiate between the two? You know, I think there is a difference between the two. Um, green washing, as you said in that definition, is, is investing more time and money in marketing than in um, than in actually changing the operations of the company to become more green. When it comes to financial products, I don't think that is, you know, that there's definitely some of that in financial products. There are financial products that exist that were not green products at all. And then the label got changed to have ESG in the name and uh, nothing actually changed in the fundamental uh, process of picking the, the underlying companies that, that are invested in in the, in the product. So that, that does happen. But I, I don't think that is where the problem ends in, um, in invest, investing in finance. Uh, I think it actually, there's a lot more nuance than that. And, and what it comes down to is a, a miscommunication, really, between um, the public at large that invests and people within the finance industry. I think that um, there are so many terms like the term ESG uh, in particular is something that the average person has never heard of and doesn't know what it means. But in the financial industry, it's thrown around like everyone should know what it means. And, and what, does, what does ESG mean? ESG stands for environment, environmental, social and governance. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it's really the umbrella term that's thrown around in the financial industry for any type of investment strategy that is meant to be aligned with one's values. Mm -hmm. Uh, whether it be environmental or social or governance related, uh, oftentimes funds try to focus on all three um, if they market themselves as ESG. But, you know, my experience and what it turns out, a lot of people have had the, a similar experience to me was I would say, you know, to, to our 401k advisors, I would like a client friendly investment fund. And they would say, oh, let me go find the ESG funds we have. And so I thought, oh, what's ESG? Is that the same thing? And um, it turns out the answer is no. You know, in the minds of people in the financial industry, it tends to be the same thing as climate friendly. But for people who care about climate change and really, you know, addressing it on the on the speedy scale that we need to to be able to turn this around, um, it, it's actually quite different. For example, the vast majority of ESG funds are invested in fossil fuel companies, including companies like. Exxon Mobil and Chevron mm -hmm. that are actively trying to prevent progress in climate regulations that would keep us safe. And I've um, been accused of greenwashing in their marketing campaign and trying to you know, expand their brand. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think that it's um, any mal, you know, malicious intent on behalf mm -hmm. of the portfolio managers that are deciding to put these companies in their ESG branded portfolios. I think it's that they've been trained to think about ESG in, in a certain way. And that is very different than how the average person who's concerned about climate change thinks about climate change and investing. So, so is this, is this yeah. a matter of the financial advisors not even understanding what an ESG is and, and what the goal of, of a fund like that would be? No, it isn't. Um, I think it's a it's a the problem is that they have defined ESG to be something that is different than being a climate conscious or climate friendly fund. The mm -hmm. definition of ESG. First of all, there is no definition, but uh, mm -hmm. which means every firm has come up with their own definition of ESG. And that that's one big problem for for the confusion. But then on top of that. Financial managers have been educated throughout their whole careers, especially when it comes to retirement investing, to have well diversified portfolios. And one of the aspects of diversification is making sure that they have investments across every sector of the economy, every industry mm -hmm. type. And so the idea of excluding an entire industry, the energy industry, which is, uh, you know, if you look at the, the energy stocks in, in the S&P 500, they're all fossil fuel companies. So the idea of excluding them entirely is is unthinkable to a traditional uh, fund manager because they always are trying to make sure that they have a similar exposure to each industry that you know the S and P five hundred does. So if it's two and a half percent of the S and P five hundred is is in energy, they need to make sure their portfolio also is two and a half percent in energy. And so oftentimes the way they'll go about making it an ESG portfolio is by 
overweighting and underweighting the exposure to the different companies based mm-hmm. on ESG factors, one of which is oftentimes carbon footprint, but it's also other, you know, social factors, governance factors, and they'll come up with a proprietary way of weighting uh, these different factors. And then they'll come up with a weight for each company. And so oftentimes they'll, they'll weight more heavily. Um, like, for example, there was a BlackRock ETF that came out not too long ago that got a lot of press because climate friendly and it was the first ETF to reach a billion dollars in trading on its first day of trading showed how much pent up demand there is for climate friendly ETFs still was invested the same amount, I think about 5% in the fossil fuel industry. So the same as uh, the, the S&P 500, but they had overweighted companies that said they had a lower carbon footprint in their fossil fuel extraction um, uh, operations and um, underweighted the ones that had higher carbon emissions in their fossil fuel extraction operations, Mm -hmm. which to me or an average person just seems like you're missing the point, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But to them, it it was a, you know, very methodical, uh, logical way uh, of going about it. And so how do you, for your funds, um, how do you how do you make the certification? Is there any financial certifications uh, that a investor can uh, use in order to go through this? Is this something that you have to go through each individual stock to see, you know, the kind of companies that are in there? What what what, what metric do you use to to measure these funds? There's no um, regulatory kind of government assigned metric on ESG today. And this is something that the SEC is looking at regulating to address the problem of greenwashing. Um, In the meantime, there are some great nonprofits that have their own uh, ways of measuring impact um, and climate friendliness. And one that the one that I found to be the most helpful is called As You Sow, and they run a mm-hmm. website called FossilFreeFunds.org. Mm-hmm. And you can type in a ticker for any fund there, and it will tell you how heavily invested that fund is in the fossil fuel industry. So it's a matter of transparency. Are you seeing a lack of transparency in financial institutions and, and vehicles? Yeah, before As You Sow existed, it was hard to figure out. Um, you know, before As You Sow. Before they made these tools, fossilfreefunds.org, they, they have similar tools for different issues like prisons or weapons, um, depending on what you're what what you care about in investing. And before that existed, it was really hard for an average consumer to figure out what are they actually investing in in this mutual fund. Um, I don't think uh, financial managers are trying to be obstructionist. You know, the information is there; it's available. They publish what what companies the funds are invested in, but it's really hard to wait to, to kind of work your way through. It takes a lot of time and effort, which is why the, as you so uh, resources like fossilfreefunds.org are so helpful because they get really clear and easy to understand right. uh, right. what type of companies is, is each mutual fund invested in. Interesting. Uh, just as a side note in, in the mid eighties, I talked to my financial advisor and I wanted to have more <clears throat> environmentally responsible Um, investments. And this was 86, obviously. And my advisor said, it's important that you invest with your head and not with your heart, which I thought was an interesting uh, comment to say. Um, And and back then, certainly, um, the understanding was that um, environmentally um, responsible funds weren't as, weren't, weren't returning as high return as you know, the traditional uh, utility funds. Um, Have you seen a change in that? Are you seeing um, that um, more responsible funds are are doing better as far as returns are concerned? There have definitely been studies showing that. And when it comes to fossil-free investing, there is data going back 40 years showing that excluding the fossil fuel industry from a strategy actually either has no impact on returns or, or most commonly increases returns. Uh, because that industry has been underperforming compared to the economy at large for quite a while. Um, But there has definitely been a huge shift in the perception just in the past couple of years, honestly, of how um, uh, of how having an environmental lens to investing impacts performance. And, you know, 
it, it's not hard to understand why people thought that it would have a negative impact on returns. Um, you know, if you the thinking goes, a the theory was if you limit in any way what types of stocks you can invest in, then you're limiting your ability to choose the highest performing stocks. So logically mm-hmm. speaking, it must have a negative impact on performance. Um, but uh, still, still yet there were more and more, you know, over the past couple of decades, there've been more and more people taking an environmental lens to their investing and the returns have shown that that, that has not proven to be true. And, and now the theory goes that if a company is paying attention to the environment and all the ESG factors and environment, social good and governance, then they ha- they are more long term thinking company that will outperform over the longer term, and that that seems to be true. Um, and finally, enough studies have come out that it's becoming uh, generally accepted knowledge. Even just you know, I started Sphere a year ago, and even one year ago, when I was having conversations, people would tell me, "Oh, there's no way you could have as good of returns." And then I, I almost never hear that now. One year later. So it's amazing how quickly opinions have changed. So so what's your experience as to what caused this change? You said it was about two years ago, three years ago, that there was a shift in this sector. What do you think was responsible for that? There's been a huge increase in interest in climate friendly and ESG investing over those few years. Um, and I think because advisors have started hearing so many people ask for this, they're starting to investigate it more deeply and, and learn more about it. Uh, and why has there been this increase in interest in climate friendly and ESG investing? Honestly, I think it's a few things. I think it's a combination of, um, of, of like basically there are two main trends that really shifted public opinion, especially in the U.S. on climate change in particular. One is we just started having more extreme weather events, right? right. With, with these fires raging in the forest and hurricanes. Um, And so most people have been touched by extreme weather events by this point uh, and have started to worry on a personal level about climate change. Um, Add to that the sunrise movement of young people who stormed Nancy Pelosi's office um, and demanded that the Democratic Party put climate change on the Democratic agenda in a real way for the first time ever. That led to a huge increase in the coverage that climate change got in in media nationwide. All of a sudden, all the newspapers were talking about climate change in a way that they never had before, on a frequency that they never had before. All of a sudden, it was part of the national conversation, and it became unacceptable to to report on weather events without mentioning the link to climate change, um, whereas that was rare before, before that. So there's been this shift in public awareness on climate change, which I believe has led to a shift in... Um, the desire for people investing money to invest in climate friendly ways. And I think that wave of requests coming into financial advisors has led financial advisors to stop brushing people off the way that yours did in 1986 Mm -hmm. um, and start actually thinking, Hmm, maybe there's something to it. And, you know, for me personally with IR labs is 401k. I don't think it's that it took three years of pushing because three years was the right amount of time to ask. I think it's that, the financial advisors in 2017, they weren't really worried about climate or ESG. In 2020, they had started hearing so many requests for this that they realized, oh, if they didn't find us some good options, they would be losing us as a customer, you know, and there's this fear of missing out and this realization that they need to stay on top of this trend or they're going to they're going to lose customers, lose money. Well, there's so. such a movement in this direction. You think that there would be just real um desire to have these vehicles that, um, you know, it's, it's got a ready audience out there who is very anxious to put their money where the heart is and to, you know, they're certainly doing this as far as consumption is concerned. Um, you know, and this is why the, the situation with greenwashing is so important, uh, in that, um, consumers will, will look at, um, products that have, green in them or a leaf or some kind of made up uh, certification and they will buy that more than just a plain bottle because they really really want to believe that um, that the product is doing what it says Uh, so again this comes to a point where for investment how do you how, how do you certify that these companies are 
doing what they're doing. They're investing in what they're they're saying. Is there some way to um, to, to expose the greenwashing in this area? I'd love to hear your answer to that question as somebody who's leading this within, you know, kind of a consumer products focused or, you know, maybe it's B2B, you're selling hangers to, um, well, to, to yeah. companies, but <clears throat> still, um, I would love to hear, you know, how have you tried to make sure that your own company is actually investing the dollars in, in changing operations rather than um, marketing? Well, with, with Ditto, we started from the ground up as a green uh, company. Um, we started a company called Greenheart Global, which in, 19, in uh, 2006, which was a um, green product design company, meaning that we reverse design all our products so they would be able to be collected at the end of their useful life um, with what other, whatever systems were there at the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, uh, we were looking for a product that, everybody could touch and use every day a ubiquitous product that we could use these creds on. And I was my partner at the time, Larry Chernikoff, who came up with the idea of a uh, replacement for the dry cleaning hanger. You know, those hangers that we have piled up in our closets and our garages. And we started looking at hangers and started realizing that it was the plastic retail hangers that were the problem. So really, uh, we, we spent two and a half years of R&D. We went overseas, looked at clothing uh, factories that the hangers were plastic hangers that were being put on. We went to DCs. We talked to logistic firms. We spent two and a half hours looking through recycling centers and throwing our different designs through the centers to make sure they come out. So we've always been um, uh to, uh, completely grounded in sustainability. We were one of the earliest B Corps. Um, we were uh, awarded a B Corp certification in 2007. Um, so we, we are very honest with our clients and what can and can't be. And, and one of the biggest problems that we're finding now that in the last two or three years, like the investment world, um, people are starting to look at retail and saying that they don't want to shop in an in environment that's just a sea of plastic hangers. So all these companies are coming up with these, you know, green solutions like making hangers out of ocean plastic, which is, which is lovely, but that hanger is 100% unrecyclable at the end of its useful life. It goes into a landfill. It's, it's not recyclable. Plastic hangers, it's, it's been a, a problem all along. So... Um, it's just speaking, you know, about um, the, the problem with product design. And uh, there are some certifications out there. You know, there's Green Seal and, and a UL Eco logo and things like that, that uh, products can get certified as a, as a third party. But I, I really believe in certifying the company, and that's why we did B Corp. Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, so uh, going back to financials, which I think is really, I mean, how do we, how can you use financials? How can you use investments to change the industry? Um, you know, how can you, how can you expose um, or do you expose companies that say that their funds are green and they're really, they really aren't? What, what is Sphere's policy about that? How do you deal with that? So our approach is one of divestment, and it's one of several approaches that are out there. Different investment managers will have different answers to this question. And while I was thinking about the financial industry and how I wanted to create, create impact on climate change by making money talk, I was really considering, you know, what is the best way to create change on, on the speed with the speed on that time scale that we need uh, with climate change right now, which is quite urgent. We have seven years left before we hit one and a half degrees Celsius of warming um, mm -hmm. beyond which the planet will be a pretty scary place to live. Um, and so for me, it was all about how do we change the systems we live in the systems of society as quickly as possible. Um, and really looking at money as a tool because money, money talks, you know, when money moves, it really, um, makes a splash and can create behavior change, especially it can create 
um, policy change. Um, and at first I was actually quite skeptical of the, of divestment as a tool for change because I thought, you know, I was trying to think just, you know, I have a background in economics and I was trying to think, uh, of, of the, the levers, what happens when you take money away from certain stocks? Okay. You stop investing in fossil fuel companies. Ideally you drag down the stock prices of those companies. Um, but so what, you know, um, what, how does that actually translate into climate action? Uh, sure. Maybe it'll make it harder for them to raise capital to do further oil exploration. But the truth is fossil fuel companies already have enough known oil reserves to screw the planet over multiple times. Right. So, um, it, it just didn't seem to be enough to really move the needle on climate change. Mm-hmm. Um, but then again, I just kept coming back to this issue of you know, all these people who are really worried about climate change and who are investing in fossil fuel companies. That misalignment makes no sense. Why is it that over 80% of Americans are worried about climate change, but over 99% of Americans with investments are investing in fossil fuel companies? And I think because of that misalignment, it just kept nagging at me and I couldn't stop thinking about um about this problem. And I, I ended up realizing, you know what, divestment doesn't have to stop there. It doesn't just have to be about taking dollars away from fossil fuel companies. We can do more by giving fossil fuel companies a, a road to becoming, a path to becoming investable again. And if we give them very clear um, criteria of what will make us invest in them again, that can be a real way to create behavior change within the fossil fuel companies, which is what we need to see. Do you think that the the government has any hand in this? Do you think that, you know, politically um, using political action as a way of changing the way um, these funds are are regulated or, you know, is there any area in there that that individuals can, can force the market to have more green, green funds? Absolutely. I mean, I think when it comes down to it, the government is the way that we as a human species self-organize, right? And so if we want to create change, government is generally the best way to create change, especially the systemic type of change that we need to address climate change. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's absolutely a role for government when it comes to regulating and defining green investments. Yes. And that's something that the Biden administration is already working on. Uh, But more importantly, there's a role for government to regulate carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's just something we haven't been able to accomplish yet. Um, And what about carbon credits? I mean, what about that as as far as a as a way of controlling um, environmental, you know, as as far as production is concerned and rewarding uh, cleaner companies versus um, non-clean companies? Carbon credits, I'm glad you brought that up because it's definitely tied in with greenwashing. Um, You know, carbon credits can be uh, an amazing tool for progress. Um, There's some amazing stories you hear about of of them really enabling um, new business models for companies Mm -hmm. that protect the earth that wouldn't be possible without carbon credits. Mm -hmm. So the concept is it can be a good one. There's been a lot of skepticism around it because um, there have been a lot of issues around carbon credits and um, the the actual carbon offset, not you know, when, when people dive into looking into, is the carbon impact there that we're paying for? Realizing actually, no, you know, is it, for example, people thought they were planting trees that would be removing X amount of carbon from the air, but it turns out that the, the trees that were planted using their carbon credit um, got burned down in a wildfire a year later or got chopped down by some other organization. And, you know, whoever was planting them was not doing the job of protecting those trees and making sure that the sustained impact was there from the carbon credit. Um, so there's been a lot of skepticism around carbon credits as well. So I think, you know, there, it, it, it there, there are pros and cons. And again, there's a huge role for regulations to, to be able to make carbon credits higher quality. And there was actually a, a lot of progress uh, at COP26 in Glasgow um, on that topic in terms mm-hmm. of international consensus around that. You know, amazingly enough, prior to that meeting, uh, 
every carbon credit could have been double counted because the country that was selling the carbon credit uh, could count the carbon <laughs> removal as well as the country that was buying the carbon credit. And there was no consensus about how to deal with that problem. Uh, and so finally, there was agreement on that in Glasgow, which is great. So I think there is progress being made. Um, but fundamentally, if you, if you take a step back and look at carbon credits, um, I think some of the biggest buyers of carbon credits are fossil fuel companies, right? Because mm -hmm. they're kind of saying, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is Literally. our business. We're still going to be extracting and burning fossil fuels. Um, so let's just offset that. And yeah. if you take I that step back and look at this holistically, that the reason climate change is a problem is because we're burning fossil fuels. And there's no amount of tree planting or other activity we can do with carbon extraction that will come close to solving this problem unless we first stop burning fossil fuels. That's the first right. thing that needs to happen. Right. And it's a huge problem with greenwashing if they can kind of brand themselves as being green. Oh, you're pumping gas for your car, but you're, we're offsetting, you know, that those carbon credits, you're fine. Don't worry about it. If that's the mentality we have, there's no way we're going to solve this in the next seven years that we have to solve it. Yeah. Or pushing it off into the consumer and saying, well, you have to use less gas and you have to drive less and, you know, doing that. Um, I, yes. I was in a store that's the other day and I saw a label on a packaging big green disc on it that said uh, plastic neutral. This, this, our product is plastic neutral and had a, had a symbol on it and everything. And I looked up the, the company that certified that. And what it said was they're still using plastic for packaging and in the processing, but they remove ocean plastic, the, the equal amount of ocean plastic in order to offset it. And it's kind of the same thing where you're paying to, to collect this material. Yeah. Um, it just, it just kind of pushes it down the road and doesn't really solve the problem. Is, is that a form of greenwashing too, where um, is the basic concept um, disingenuous? You know, as long as there are loopholes in that process, I think it can be very valuable, right? Like yeah. I was listening to a podcast, I think it was on um, uh, How to Save the Planet, where they interviewed um, um, somebody in Northern California um, who was doing an incredible job protecting the trees um, in that region, mm -hmm. uh, preventing them from being cut down, keeping old growth forests growing, and um, and was able to, to exit the business of sustainable logging, which was how they had kept their community um, uh, afloat. You know, they, they did do logging, but they made sure it was sustainable and not clear cutting, et cetera. But because of carbon credits, all of a sudden they didn't need to do that anymore. Just keeping the trees growing really earned them more money than the sustainable logging industry. Um, that's an example of the type of business model that it's amazing that we can do that now. And, and there's real value in keeping that old growth forest there. Um so I, I don't think that carbon credits are by definition disingenuous, but I think as long as anyone is disingenuous with them, as long as there's any carbon credit that isn't really having the carbon impact right. that we think it is, that just tarnishes the entire industry. Um, if we can't be 100% sure, you know, if, if we're 100% sure that we're actually removing carbon uh, in, in, a, in a certifiable way to offset all of the carbon that we're burning mm -hmm. um, from fossil fuels, um, then, then yes, we have one. But there just aren't enough ways to create carbon credits to right. offset right. the amount of fossil fuels that we're burning right now, right? Like that, the fossil fuel burning still needs to be reined way in before right. that market works where supply and demand actually match up. Right. So first it's about making sure that, that the, the removal is real right. And, right. and then, and then it's about regulating, right? Like mm -hmm. making sure that we actually are requiring uh, on a global level for humanity to not burn more fossil fuels than mm -hmm than carbon that we're removing. And those are very challenging things to do. So in the meantime, the fastest way to create impact is to stop burning fossil fuels. Right. Do you feel like this is incremental? I mean, did, that the carbon uh, credit is, is really a way of, of fining um, carbon intensive companies. You know, they have to pay for these credits. Um, do, do you think that this, 
it, it's a step in the right direction as far as um, a way of bringing these companies to at, at least recognize the, the carbon output that they're producing? You know, I, I think it's great that they feel that they need to be buying these credits at this point. Mm -hmm. We should have been regulating this a long time ago and requiring them mm -hmm. to offset their carbon. Uh, we've failed to put that type of international agreement in place where that's required. But now the court of public opinion is making it happen anyway. Right. So that's huge. Um, policy needs to catch up with public opinion at that point. And that's where we are. Yeah. Over 80% of Americans are worried about climate change and want our government to take climate action. Um, and that includes not just a, a majority of Democrats, but also a majority of Republicans. I think mm -hmm. it's 53 percent of Republicans want the government to be taking climate action. Mm -hmm. So why aren't we? Uh, and this is why at, at Sphere, we're really targeting the fossil fuel industry, because it's clear that the reason the politicians aren't doing this isn't because the public doesn't want it. The public is there. It's because lobbyists are putting right. their, lining their pockets, telling right. them not to. There was this crazy video that came out of... Um, uh, an ExxonMobil lobbyist who thought he was interviewing for a new job opportunity. Um, and turns out it was actually a journalist who was recording the interview and uh, <laughs> the public. And he was bragging about how he has, how, how you know, the fossil fuel industry has Joe Manchin in their pocket. Right. Uh, and that explains why, you know, despite the, the coal union, the coal workers unions of Joe Manchin's state have asked him to pass the Build Back Better Act and the climate provisions in that act, he still is obstructing it. And of course he is. The fossil fuel lobbyists are making sure he will. Right. So that's why at, at, at Sphere, our message is, hey, fossil fuel companies, we're not going to keep investing in you until you change your behavior. Mm -hmm. We need to come to the table and have an adult conversation about how we keep ourselves safe and how we limit warming to one and a half degrees and help us yeah. with legislation that limits that warming. It will apply it equally to all fossil fuel companies. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, no one, no one fossil fuel company will be hurt more than others by that. But you should have a seat at the table helping us figure out what that legislation looks at. Um, Otherwise, we'll, we'll, we'll never create legislation that makes sense if, if they're not part of that conversation. Once the legislation is passed, we'll invest again. Right. One, one thing that I'm focused on is plastic and uh, because of the products, product design. And that's what we're um, competing with price wise is sustainable materials versus plastic, which is subsidized in the oil industry, which is subsidized. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that a, a, a now that fossil fuel companies are starting to uh, see reductions in um, heating fuel and uh, you know more electricity uh, for energy, uh, they're going heavily into plastics, and um, that's really their their big focus these days. Uh, part of, a lot of what I do is educate my clients and educate um, producers. Um, logistics, all kinds of things, because everything's involved with sustainability as far as making it run better and, and using less material and energy. Do you spend a lot of your time educating your clients, uh, educating financial institutions as to um, your knowledge in this field? And is, is that a major part of your job? I do. Yeah, it's a huge part. And we kind of started out the conversations uh, talking about how oftentimes it's a misalignment in, in language and, you know, mm -hmm. misunderstanding. And so it is, I think, just it has to be education to get people understanding what they're looking for. You know, it's educating financial advisors and 401k advisors on what their clients actually want. When they're asking for climate friendly options, they're not asking for the average ESG fund. Um, it's helping them understand the difference. Um, and then it's educating employees at companies who are asking for climate friendly options in their 401ks, educating them on what is ESG, what does that mean? And, mm -hmm. um, uh, and so, yeah, it, it's a constant um, process of education. Absolutely. And, and that's why we have a blog a section of our website. Um, and we, we try to put kind of educational materials out there to, mm -hmm. because people are, um, people are definitely interested in learning. We found that yeah. it's had a good reception. And, and I, I find that interesting. And, um, uh... And it's just common sense to me because I've spent so much time researching this and delving into it. And it's always interesting that people just don't understand it. And um, when I when I see a green claim, for instance, my 
red flags go up and I have to look at it rather than um, a lot of people who just go, you know, I believe in this. And so, you know, I want to believe in it. So we're going to do it. So, yeah, education is a part of it. Uh, we're kind of reaching the end of our, our talk. I did want to ask you about um, economics and as far as um, uh, different economic levels and how people uh, who can afford it can diversify their portfolio in a far more green way than people who don't have um, you know, a lot of money to work with. Do you see this as being an economic situation where um, people, it's, it's a class divide kind of, as a who can afford to invest in green and, and who cannot? It definitely is. Um, there are a lot of green investment options out there for high net worth individuals and institutions. Um, you look at some of the biggest investors out there, the Harvard Endowment, um, mm -hmm. Or, you know, pension funds, which have more power because it's a single manager of a large pool of money, like the New York State Pension Fund and the New York City Pension Fund. Um, along with the Harvard Endowment, they, they've all decided to divest from fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just a smart moral choice, but it's also a smart financial choice um, in their opinions. Uh, we don't have that option in 401ks right now. And the vast majority of Americans, their only way of investing is via their 401ks. Right. Um, and so, yes, there's a huge difference in what's available to wealthy investors or high net worth individuals and institutions and, and regular people who invest via their 401ks. So you think these pension funds are, are a, a big motivator to moving greener? I, I know that San Francisco, they're, their um, funds have all divested in fossil fuels, and I'm, I'm sure many in the Bay Area have. Um, that seems like a pretty powerful incentive for um, for financial investments to to move towards a greener portfolio. Yeah, and that's why financial managers are all diving into the ESG sector now. And all, everyone's offering an ESG product, and, and that's part of why the greenwashing problem exists. Um, but, you know, those those wealthier individuals can pay to have these custom strategies created where mm -hmm. they are actually divested from fossil fuels. It's not just greenwashing that says it's green, but still invest in Exxon. Um, when it comes to 401ks, it's it's just an extremely price sensitive group of, of, of investors. And the strategies that the wealthier investors use tend to be actively managed, which is expensive. Having somebody mm -hmm. actively picking right. stocks costs a lot of money. Um, and the reason we created the Sphere um, 500 Fossil Free Fund was because we thought, you know, you don't have to have an active manager in this expensive approach to, to avoiding fossil fuel investments. You can have a rules-based passive index fund that does that that avoids fossil fuel companies. And sure, it won't, it won't be as thoughtful about picking the better companies to invest in, but at least you can take out the fossil fuel companies mm -hmm. and offer that to regular people who only invest via 401ks. Um, so that's what we did. And we really had a, a focus on, on having a low fee to make it accessible in 401ks. So who's your client? I mean, who, who, who are you approaching? Are you approaching individuals? Are you approaching pension funds? Are you approaching financial advisors? Which who's your All of the, um, So we created this for 401ks, which means mm -hmm. there are two groups that we are, um, selling this to. One is everyday people who invest via 401ks, the employees at companies. But before we can even approach them, uh, we have to get the companies offering this as an option in their 401ks. Get it approved and, and part of their package, right? Yeah. And so there it's, it's convincing the benefits manager, the head of HR to add this, as well as um, as the 401k advisors, these financial advisors that, mm. that are very influential in those de decisions. Mm. Um, but then again, our product is also a mutual fund. So it's available to anyone to invest in. And because it's low cost, it's attractive to a lot of people, even outside of 401ks. So, Wonderful. Yeah. Well, we're, we're reaching the end of our time. I don't know how much we have here, but I really appreciate uh, talking to you and learning more about this. Uh, I know that the financial market is fraught with greenwashing and, and um, you know, getting beyond it. I think we're just in the beginning of being able to 
uh, institutionalize green, greener investments. And I think that you're a wonderful job uh, doing it. Thank you so much. It's been a fun conversation. All right. And I think we're out of time. I think we just, uh, we just got shut off. So yeah. um, really great talking to you. And I, I hope to learn more about what you're doing. And uh, I'll certainly follow you uh, going forward on LinkedIn and other social media. And I, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. And right back at you. It's been All fun. right. I know you. All right. Bye. Have a great day. You too.